Hey guys, I thought this was really good, and uh, I want to share this with you. This is on a preterist website, preteristarchive.com, and preterism uh, basically teaches that like all the prophecies and stuff, uh, or all the all the end times events were fulfilled like in 70 A.D. and um, like Daniel's 70th week, the abomination of desolation. And I don't know. I don't. I still need a lot, a lot to learn about it. But I'm not saying that I'm a preterist. And there's different kinds of preterists. Different. Some of them still say that some of the stuff still is going to happen in the future. There's like partial preterism and, uh, you know, full preterism. But anyways, uh, I do find a lot of their views interesting, and it kind of opens up my understanding to different things, and makes me kind of think outside of the box. It's always good to, good to study, you know, different views anyways. <clears throat> but I pretty much agree with this spot on, these first couple uh, things I'm going to read, and I, need, I still need to read more, but here is the second coming of Jesus associated with the end of the individual at death, which is you know, what I pretty much said, um, I think, in the first Thessalonians chapter 4, the, the rapture video, where I said it doesn't really teach the rapture, but the coming of the Lord is at death. So those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord would mean, you know, those of us who are alive right now, we continue in Christ. When the Lord comes at the moment of death, then we will be raised and meet, you know, the dead in Christ that were before us, that, were, that are already raised. But I think I might have mentioned this verse too. It's really good. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And actually, I can read from the King James Version because that's not there. But... And it's really good to, to to look at verse 28, too, which I haven't really included that. But it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And then it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So it's talking about death, and then after that the judgment. And then it talks about the appearing of Christ and for those who follow him, they, they receive, you know, salvation, basically. So, you know, again, this looks like the appearing of Christ is associated, you know, with after death. Uh, when, when you see Christ, when he is manifest, is, is basically, you know, the just of it, I think. And, uh... You know, like Paul said, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And what I'm going to read is going to mention that too. Uh, but I guess here's two historical preterists. Uh, and I pretty much agree with almost all of what they say. Um, there's maybe there's some things I don't agree with. But Ellicott, I don't know who any of these people are. But this person says that Paul, in these words, assumes the nearness of the coming of the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> cannot be positively... That Paul, in these words, assumes the nearness of the coming of the Lord cannot be positively asserted. The day of Christ, whether far off or near, is to each individual the decisive day. It is practically coincident that with the day of his death and, be, and becomes, when addressed to the individual, an exaltation and amplification of the term. So that's talking about the day of Christ, whether far off or near, is to each individual the decisive day. Um, okay, now this is a longer one, James Gall, but this one's really good. Uh, at the same time, there are parts of the prophecy which cannot be applied to the destruction of Jerusalem, such as the sun being darkened and the moon not giving her light, and particularly the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. But what we wish especially to call attention to is the exhortation to watchfulness which our Lord gives at the end of the chapter, this would be like Matthew 24, and the illustrations of the danger of not being prepared. These cannot refer to the destruction of Jerusalem, neither can they refer to the second coming. The only possible reference is to the coming of Christ at death. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then, who then is a faithful 
and why servant whom his lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season blessed is that servant whom his lord when he cometh shall find so doing verily i say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart my lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware of, and he shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verses 48 through 51, Matthew 24. This parable cannot possibly refer to the destruction of Jerusalem because preparedness for it did not consist of being a good servant but in readiness to run away he that was in the field was not to turn back and take his clothes in regard to the destruction of jerusalem watchfulness was not required a great number of things were to happen before it took place there were to be wars famines pestilences earthquakes and so on and more especially, Jerusalem was to be compassed about with armies, and the abomination of desolation was to be standing where it ought not. Until these things came to pass, there was no need of watching, nor were they even to be troubled in their minds in regard to it. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, Our Lord's command to watch therefore cannot refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. Neither can it refer to the second coming of Christ for obvious reasons. We have in a parable in the parable an exhortation to all both good and bad to watch for christ's coming enforced by two illustrations one that of a faithful servant whom his lord when he came found in the discharge of his duty the other that of an evil servant who pursuing upon his lord's absence abused the trust responded in him and was caught red-handed in his wickedness what we wish particularly to notice is that in both cases the master comes when he is not expected, and in the case of the evil servant, rests him in his wicked career and punishes him at the same time. We ask, when is it that the master comes to each of these servants? And in order to induce our millenarian friends to help us in clearing up the difficulty, we will show them that they are in the same position with ourselves because upon their own grounds there was no need of watching for the second coming of Christ at that moment when our lord was speaking we must therefore look for a coming against which not only we but the very people who are listening to our lord at the same time are commanded to watch what i say unto you i say unto all watch mark chapter 13 verse 37 <clears throat> and this is why i couldn't agree with the mid-trib or the post-trib positions among many other reasons but uh, most of them you know he says he says, because upon their own grounds there was no need of watching for the second coming of Christ at that moment when our Lord was speaking. So, if Daniel's 70th week is in the future, and, uh, you know, the Lord, they teach, you know, the Lord's not supposed to come until three and a half years after the abomination of desolation, and, you know, none of that's even happened yet. And, and then they read these uh, passages that I just read about, you know, watch for the Lord, he'll, he'll come in an hour when you know not, and they say that refers to, you know, the second advent or the second coming after, three and a half years after the abomination of desolation. That makes absolutely no sense, because you're just saying, I'm coming at any moment, you have to be ready now, and so that's why I took, you know, the pre-trib position, because that is supposed to happen at any time. Um, it made the most sense, but but then I start seeing flaws and, and things not working with that either. So this, uh, absolutely, and now reading that other people agree with this and exactly teach the same thing. I mean, you have to see this, especially, you know, the latter part of Matthew 24. Jesus is talking about death, you know, coming at an hour when you know not. So... I want to clear that up, but in the first place, we must not confuse the question by confounding the suddenness of the event with the need of watching against it. It may be sudden, and yet there may be no need for watching until the time comes uh, when it is possible. Our Lord's second coming will be sudden, whether it happen now or after the millennium. The suddenness of the coming need not be a difficulty. 
We may therefore set aside for the present all the passages which speak of the suddenness of the coming as irrelevant to this question, and confine ourselves alone to those which inculcate watching. In the second place, we lay down as a principle that this coming of the Son of Man must be something that may happen at any moment to any one of those to whom the command was or is addressed. It cannot be an event which cannot happen immediately, and more especially it cannot be an event which must be preceded by other notable events which must take place before it. It is. It must be something that might happen the next day or even the next hour to those who heard him. Can there be any doubt then that what our Lord referred to was death? It is the one and only event which may take place at any moment at all, or any moment to all, and it is the one for which it is of most importance to be prepared. It is said, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. That is to say, engaging in his Lord's work, giving to the household their meat in due season, surely that must be at death, because if it, if it be not at death, but only at the resurrection, and so this is one of the things, you know, besides talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and stuff, and I don't know if everything applies to that or not, but I also think that you know, the resurrection also kind of happens at death. Is there another resurrection? I don't know, but I think that a lot of times when the resurrection is mentioned, it's talking about being raised and corruptible at the moment of death, at the coming of the Lord, which is death, which is what I'm reading right now that's teaching that. But anyways, instead of finding the faithful servant engaged in his master's work, he will find him in his grave where he has been resting from his labors perhaps for centuries. How then can it be said that he found him watching? In opposition to this view, it is said that at death Christ does not come to the saint, but the saint goes to Christ. We answer that that cannot be, for Christ comes for the saint. The saint does not go to Christ at death. There's no passage of scripture that says that the saint goes to Christ at death. The thing is impossible. Christ says that he is the way, but what is the use of a way that does not come to us? If we have to find our road to the way at death, it would imply a want in Christ in regard to that for which we stand most in need of him. No, Christ must come for us, else we should never find the way to heaven where he is. He has said that no man can come to the Father but by him. But if he is not the way to the Father, it would be as difficult to go to Christ as to go to the Father. How helpless should we be at death if Christ did not come for us? Let not your hearts be troubled, said Jesus, neither let them be afraid. If I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And yes, I would agree that that is at death as well. Millenari millenarians, so I don't know if he's talking about premillennials exactly or what, but anyways, they say this passage does not refer to death, but at, to the second coming. But Paul says the very opposite, for he says that when the saint departs from the body, he is present with the Lord. And thenceforth is ever with the Lord. Either Paul or the millenarians must be wrong. For how could the saint be with Christ at death if Christ not be not present? How could Christ tell his disciples there and then not to let their hearts be troubled if it was to be 1,800 years before he fulfilled his promise? If they have been present with Christ for 1,800 years, then there would be no need for his, second, for his coming for them. They are with him already. We next turn to the evil servant and we ask, when was it that his Lord came? Was it at his death or was, or is it still in the future? It surely cannot be at Christ's second coming because it was to happen at a time when the servant was not aware and while he was beating his fellow servants and saying, My Lord delayeth his coming, the only time at which he could be arrested in his wickedness was at his death, else he is not arrested yet. 
But there is another difficulty which our friends have constructed for themselves. If the evil servant is not caught flagrant delicto at his death, I don't know. It cannot be at Christ's second coming because it is only the dead in Christ that rise then. And the rest of the dead, including the evil servant, continue in their graves until a thousand years are finished. His Lord, therefore, must needs further delay his coming till after the millennium. Okay, I'll have to read over that again, but I also think, you know, I said I think that First Thessalonians chapter 4, the end of it is talking about death and the resurrection that occurs after death, not talking about saints, you know, living, not having to taste death, but, uh, and then First Thessalonians 5 continues on and talks about, you know, the day of the Lord and it comes upon the wicked when, you know, they're saying peace and safety and they're not expecting it. So I think that goes along with death, death as well, the suddenness of it. So I would think in that passage in First Thessalonians 5, the day of the Lord is the day at the moment of death when the Lord comes. Um, okay. It just seems to all fit. But then other questions arise, but everything will have to be worked out. We conclude, therefore, that the time when Christ comes and finds men prepared or unprepared is death. And as death may come at any time, even to the most secure, the duty of continual watchfulness is of the very greatest importance. And the thing is, too, that even if people teach a pre-trib rapture or mid-trib rapture or a post-trib rapture, they would pretty much all agree with these points. They would say, yeah, death can happen at any time. You need to be prepared. You need to make sure that you're saved. But the disagreement is, you know, on how they interpret these scriptures. And I think that, you know, first of all, trying to say that these things where Jesus says you must be prepared, this can happen at any time. Anyone who takes the mid-trip or the post-trip position on those, it just it doesn't fit at all. That's just absurd. Okay, so I understand the pre-trip a little more, but, you know, I don't believe in a rapture whatsoever now. So not as you know it's taught as far as i see it so far um anyways compared with that the duty of watchfulness for the second coming sinks into insignificance because preparedness for the one is preparedness for the other if our lord really meant to urge his hearers on that occasion to be continually watching for his second advent and warn them of the dreadful consequences of their not doing so, then we take leave to say that there was not one of them the worse for neglecting that exhortation and that warning because our Lord's second coming did not take place during their lives' times. We would even go further and say that as what our Lord said to them, he said to all both then and thereafter. There has not been one of the hundreds of millions who have read or heard his warning that has been anything the worse for neglecting it. But if, on the other hand, our Lord, when he spoke of the coming of the Son of Man as an event that might take place on any day or at any hour, meant the solemn hour of death, he uttered a warning which all men acknowledge to be important, and we may confidently affirm that among the many millions who continued to neglect that solemn exhortation and warning, there is not one this day who does not lament his having done so with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, can we suppose that any man, far less our Lord, would thus strain out so microscopic a gnat and swallow so gigantic a camel? So, I'm going to end this there, but I'll say this too. Here's a thing by Thomas Ice I've came across before, and I'm going over it again. Uh, I think this is by Thomas Ice. He's a huge pre-trib rapture person. He has a website, pretrib.org, I think. Something like that. But he has a section with tons of articles and PDFs, and it's really informational, but I think, you know, a lot of it's really wrong. And I'm coming to realize that, you know, more and more of it's wrong. But here he says this when the second, the second coming doesn't mean death. And I think all of his arguments are really erroneous. Um, it doesn't really hold up. So it just makes me think that, you know, a lot of times when it's speaking of Christ's coming, it is death. And, you know, reading what I just read to you, where it pretty much agrees with me, 
spot on, which doesn't really matter because, you know, anybody can agree with anything. There's everybody, there's a teaching for everything out there. I understand that. But it's a little bit re more reassuring to me when, you know, I see that other people have felt the same way and uh, see the same things in Scripture. And I hope that you that are watching this will see that too. Or, you know, you can give me some good reasons why that can't be true. But um, this is how I see it. So, And I haven't even finished reading. There's other ones too that believe the same thing. So... I just read this and thought it was so good that I should share it now, and I think I think it could be helpful. So it's it's worded in a lot better way than I could word it myself right now. So, God bless.